pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning. Welcome to the June 25th um, County Commission meeting. And we have the uh, we remind you to silence your cell phones. The meeting documents are available in the folder next to Commissioner Kelly. And we have listening devices available with Robert in the front row. If you need to use one, you could just talk with him. Okay. Routine business. Item one is consider a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. The motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item two is to approve the county commission minutes of June 18th, 2013. Move the minutes. Second. The motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item three are bills to be paid in the amount of $698,277.61. Pay the bills with a comment. Second. And the motion is second with a comment. Commissioner Barth. Uh, today's bills include $150,000 for correct care, uh, $50,000 for fuel in the highway department, and uh, 177 for Metro 911. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, <clears throat> inside. Motion carries unanimously. There are no reports today. Item five is personnel. Item A is to approve the routine action. Good morning, Commissioners. Jen Oddix from Human Good Resources. Morning, Jenna. Any um, questions? I have a motion. motion to approve. Second. A motion and a second for routine action. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion Call passes unanimously. Item B is a presentation of Minnehaha County Diversity Committee Annual Report. Jenny Attix. Good morning. Um, as you know, each year the Diversity Committee presents a brief presentation about its activities over the past um, 12 months. And the Diversity Committee is a committee that meets quarterly. We review county employee demographic information and discuss opportunities for increasing diversities and, and working with diverse populations throughout our county. One of the primary functions of the um, Minnehaha County Diversity Committee is, of, of course, the Affirmative Action Plan, which we presented to you in January, and then also just to act as a resource to the county and county departments on different diversity issues. Our community members for, that are currently serving terms until June 2014 are Wes Garcia from Killian Community College, Pat Krupa from the Minnehaha County Human Services Department. She's our Veteran Services Officer. And Jenny Logan from the South Dakota Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities. Mary Patterson, formerly from the Veterans Administration Hospital. And Janelle Watkins, who is also from the South Dakota Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities. And then our diversity committee also includes Commissioner Kelly as our HR liaison and two members of the HR office, myself and our director, Carrie Deaver. I'd now like to introduce Wes Garcia from our diversity committee, and he will give you a brief summary of the activities over the last 12 months. Hello. Good morning. Good to be here this morning. No. Oh. Once again, we are ready to present our affirmative action plan uh, to the uh, commissioners, but also we've done a number of activities this past year. Uh, we've had a food drive, and we've also done our annual uh, Native American Resource Fair that has had uh, very good results. Now, each year uh, on uh, October 10th, we hold that at the uh, Multicultural Center, and we have another number of uh, community uh, services come and present material as well so that uh, the Native American community can be aware of uh, resources in the community. And then we had our Super Bowl, if I pronounce that right, food drive. It was uh, raising uh, canned goods, specifically soup, for the uh, uh, Minnehaha County uh, food basket. And we raised, as you can see, 185 um, for the 49ers and 169 for the the, um, the other team. Ravens. <laughs> Ravens. Ravens. <laughs> I'm not a football fan, so I don't keep up with that. But for uh, total, we took in 354 items donated for the food pantry uh, this past year. Uh, some of the things that we look at when we review the uh, 
Affirmative action plan is the workforce analysis, uh, job group analysis, uh, comparison of incumbent and workforce availability. We'd like to see, um, or we've, we've tried in the past to see that uh, the numbers employed by the county as far as minorities match the number in the population. Uh, sometimes we've been able to do that, other times we've not been able to do that. But we've been close overall. Um, and uh, we, we have tried to uh, get postings of new jobs out to the community as best we can so that we can attract uh, minority people who are qualified for those openings. And uh, as we finish off, I'd like to share two stories with you, if I may. You know, we become so uh, technologically savvy that sometimes we forget to have uh, narrative stories. And I think uh, stories are important for who we are as human beings. And uh, one happened to me uh, many, many years ago. I won't tell you how long. When I was a, a senior in high school, I was dating a young girl for a number of months and uh, would go to church with her, would go to her family's house for dinner and everything. And one day I went to pick her up. Uh, for a date, and I was greeted at the door by her father. Very nice man, as far as I knew, because I'd known him at uh, different locations, at church and at dinner. And uh, he said, well, you can't go out with Cheryl today. And I said, well, is she not well? Is she not feeling good? Can I see her? No, you may not see her, but you can't go out. Well, what's the problem? And he looked at me and said, I found out your last name is Garcia, and I don't want my daughter dating any lazy, no good Mexican. So there is diversity. Or, or lack of diversity in, in some communities, unfortunately. And some of that we can't do anything about. But one thing we can do as far as the diversity committee is to help the staff become more um, well-versed at working with people of color in our own community. Because one thing that happened to me here in Sioux Falls, and I'm not saying it happened in the county building, but I was handing an application for something, might have been a license, might have been uh, a building permit or something of that nature, and of course at the top it says your name and she looked at me or he looked at me and said can you speak English just assuming that the last name is Garcia I don't speak English and we need to move away from that type of narrow-minded views of people and say everybody is like me and we all speak English unless you show me otherwise so with that I leave you that thought for today thank you very much thank you mr. Garcia I just want to say thank you to the whole diversity committee for their commitment and dedication to um, raising awareness here for diversity issues within the county. And we really think it's valuable to have a good, a good wide variety of people on the diversity committee to help us, um, you know, maintain and, and increase our diversity awareness. So, and I'm happy to answer any questions too if you have any. Any questions? All right. This was just a presentation. So it thank is. you, Jenny. Thanks. There are no application for abatement today, and no notices and requests, and there are no planning and zoning notices. The next item is Petition for Compromise of Lane. John Peckus. Thank you. This is on DPNO number 81632. The um, auditor's office have received an application for a compromise of lien from the current applicant. The uh, uh, county aid lien was for public defender services in the amount of $813.80. There's no real estate involved with this particular request. Uh, the applicant speaks little English, and so he did need the assistance of an interpreter. The applicant was surprised at the amount of the billing. Uh, apparently, the applicant pled guilty after a dispositional conference with the state's attorney's office. Uh, because of that, she believed that the billing would not be that high. Uh, apparently, uh, she did contact a private attorney at the beginning of her case and was told uh, he would charge roughly $400, that was an estimate. Uh, she and her family did not have the funds to pay that amount, and so naturally she turned to the public defender's office. The applicant lives with her mother, father, and three younger sisters. Uh, she is unemployed. The uh, applicant indicated that uh, the family depends on her uh, uh, father's Social Security disability payments, as well as food stamps, and apparently her mother is unable to work due to knee problems. Uh, the oldest of the uh, children, she is the primary health care provider to her parents and, of course, her, her younger sisters. The uh, applicant claims the lien of this size is an economic hardship due to her unemployment and her uh, financial position of her family. She's requesting a compromise and release of the lien of full payment upon $200. She uh, will need most likely the full year to make the payment 
and she has made a payment of approximately $5 on the lien. Uh, and of course, uh, the applicant has requested that a uh, interpreter be present here. I don't know if she's present here today. Yeah. Okay. And uh, she can address the commission uh, from where she's standing. She doesn't have to identify herself. Uh, she doesn't have to come to the podium if she wishes to uh, address the commission. The state's attorney did uh, uh, indicate that there were a variety of, um, of different court proceedings that took place in this particular case, and there wasn't just one dispositional conference. To give you an idea about how the process uh, involves, typically you have uh, what would be the um, uh, initial appearance, and then, uh, of course, you have the opportunity to enter a plea at that time, or you can request uh, an attorney or a public defender. After that, you then proceed to uh, uh, what's known as a dispositional conference. Uh, apparently, in this particular instance, there was a uh, uh, several dispositional conferences that were set, and I believe there was an indictment related to a uh, felony charge, which also uh, incorporates the uh, need of having a, uh, an arraignment, and then also a uh, new dispositional conference set by the court. So there was a variety of different procedures that took place in this particular case. And uh, once again, the public defender's office did, of course, uh, bill for the time they were involved. So uh, anyway, with that being said, I'm, I'm open to any questions. And of course, the applicant, of course, uh, obviously would like to address the commission. First, uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Question, uh, John, uh, so what does a typical private attorney uh, charge for per hour, so to speak? Oh, well, <clears throat> that rate is actually, uh, I'd say right now about $175 an hour. And what we do, uh, at least at the UJS, is the UJS typically charges, I believe, two-thirds of what the uh, uh, average pay for the attorney is in South Dakota. So it's subsidized. Uh, we already discount that. And I believe the current amount is $87.50, but I may be, I may be incorrect on that. $87.50 for the public defender's office yes. at this point. Yes. yes. Any other questions for John? This would be an opportunity if the applicant would like to speak. Like John said, you don't have to come to the podium. You can just um, say whatever <coughs> way you want to say from your seat. And you don't have to give her name. You don't have to give her name. And, you know, uh, she uh, just said that uh, her problem is that she can afford to pay uh, $813 mm -hmm. uh, for the public office. And she would like to consider her uh, of the family uh, financial situation. Any comments or questions from the commission? I, I would just comment that uh, oftentimes uh, people who make regular payments say over some period of time you know uh, five dollars every three months for two years uh, then it becomes easier for us to compromise the lien any other oh. I, I'd like to say a little Again, I, I think that uh, I, I cannot support reducing it at this time. But if we had a history of making payments, it would be easier for me. Any? Yes, she already started. 
not the main payments. Commissioner Kelly, have a comment? Well, there's no real estate involved in this, as I understand. It's uh, um, I, I I can't support the forgiveness either. I do think that if, if small payments, five dollar payments, can be made regularly, I think that would suffice. And perhaps when they get down to the four hundred dollar level or somewhere, like we could look at this thing again. But right now, um, the bill was incurred. And I think there's an expectation to pay, and she was under that understanding when she got with the city or the public defender, and therefore I will not support it. Any other comments from you? Okay. Any other comments from the commission? I'll make a motion for no action. We have a motion for no second. action and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously for no action. It means the lien will stay as it is at this time. The next item is opportunity for public comment. This is the time when the public can speak about anything that is not on the present agenda. And I see we have someone coming forward. Good morning, Bob Colby. Good morning, Colby. Commissioners. I'm Bob Colby. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, I've had some discussion with people relating to your quote unquote embalming mobile. Um, uh, the general public that I, or the pe few people I've talked to, aren't absolutely clear on what that particular need is. The feeling that most that I've talked with, and you've heard from uh, Rick Newby, that uh, he thought this ought to be a state endeavor. Uh, talk to others who thought this might be something as far as embalming that would relate to the uh, mortuary community, the, the undertakers, that they would subsidize something like this for state use. But uh, and maybe Mr. DeYoung, who's here, if you have an, a tragedy or an emergency where a large number of people have been killed, it would seem that you don't need an embalming mobile, you need a refrigeration unit because you're going to have to suspend the embalming for uh, autopsies possibly or later identification for people who uh, may not have family in the immediate community who can visually identify a person and if there's real tragedy they may have to go through a DNA process. Embalming is a thing that also has certain cultural and religious connotations that you have to be sensitive to for people who may be killed in a major disaster that uh, would strike any large populated community. So it would seem that, a, to be crass, a refrigerated truck would be more in need to take the deceased and keep them in suspended animation or suspend their uh, decomposition, as it were, until you have come to some resolution on who they are, why they are there, uh, and what embalming procedures might be uh, used because some cultures the body would be buried within 24 hours of the death. Others look upon embalming as an invasive thing into the body and you might get yourself in some kind of legal problems being insensitive to someone else's uh, funerary practices. So I think that the embalming mobile is a Though an idea of having something for a disaster is appropriate, it's more of a refrigeration problem than it is an embalming problem. And that's the take that I'm getting from some of the people that I've talked with, and maybe Mr. DeYoung would be uh, more <clears throat> capable of speaking to this because it seems like you're, you're kind of leapfrogging from a disaster to an end product without looking at that middle section. So that was just the uh, comment that I had from a few people and listening to some of the radio talk shows, etc. But I just thought, I, it seems like this needs a little more discussion and, the, uh, and an embalming mobile just doesn't sound appropriate. Thank you. Um, I think West River does have a refrigeration truck and this will be nation, I mean not nation, statewide used, but I'm, I'm gonna let Mr. DeYoung address this issue. We have talked about this and um, probably just wasn't reported well enough what direction Lynn, we were going. Uh, 
sorry to cut you off there, Commissioner Heiberger. Uh, Lindy Young, Emergency Management. Um, Commissioner Heiberger is right. Uh, basically, uh, as we look at the state of South Dakota and mass fatalities, this is something that was brought from the federal government to the state government. And then as a result of statute in the state of South Dakota, the state of South Dakota doesn't have coroners. They don't have forensic pathologists. Those responsibilities are put down on the county um, to take care of those. So in the event of a um, event that requires the services, it's a responsibility of the county to go and spend the dollars to identify these folks. Um, as a result of that, uh, several years ago, obviously you know the county uh, went out and uh, found uh, Dr. Snell, who is a forensic pathologist that works for the county along with the health systems here to do those autopsies that you most uh, often rely on for criminal events, those type of things. One of the other things that he has in his background is being part of the disaster system. Back in Alabama, he was an integral part in the state process. Um, as we looked at the state of South Dakota and at the forensic pathologist, we saw that there was one part-time in Rapid City, our full-time forensic pathologist in Sioux Falls, a couple up in Rapid or uh, the Minneapolis area, uh, one up in Fargo, and then a couple down in Omaha and in the uh, in the Des Moines area. So we took a whole region approach. Uh, with the goal that the state gave us and said what would make this go. Uh, Rapid City or Pennington County last year purchased, or in the last several years purchased a refrigeration as uh, Mr. Colby was talking about a uh, refrigeration unit. We uh, have purchased or are going to purchase the embalming slash, um, and I forget the term, autopsy, uh, autopsy trailer uh, to go with it and in the event that there is an incident that requires the services West River and East River will team up and, and come to do that. Um, we have, as we identified, both Dr. Snell and myself uh, in our yearly uh, goals for department heads, we're about three quarters of the way done with our plan and that'll be shared towards you. And then uh, all of this equipment once again is paid for uh, from a grant from health and CDC from the federal level down to the state because they don't have the capability uh, to do it, they've uh, run it down to the, the uh, locals in South Dakota here. In uh, November, we're uh, in the process of uh, getting the NTSB folks to come in. They'll do a one-day class in partnership with Sanford Health uh, here for all the, all the people that need to be there. And uh, they'll do a one-day class from NTSB. And then FEMA will do a subsequent class on the 6th and 7th so that we have a broad spectrum of how these uh, assets and tools work. Now you ask, when may this happen? And, and some of the uh, other things um, that Commissioner or that Bob Colby talked about. Um, you know, we, not too long ago, there was a plane crash in South Dakota up in the northeast part, uh, the Payne Stewart plane crash. That would be an incident. The difference in that, that incident is we know all the folks that are there. One of the things that I fear about is a 15 passenger van of migrant workers that we have in this area moving from area to area uh, uh, unfortunately crash and burn on the interstate. It would literally take weeks um, for your coroner to do all the work he needs to do to unravel all the pieces to figure that out and that's our responsibility and he doesn't have the storage space out at the uh, current morgue just to leave that work sit aside while he does that. He needs to be able to go in and do all these works. So we're trying to, with the help of federal dollars, lay out the pieces so that unfortunately, if an event does happen like this in South Dakota, East River, West River can come together, get those two uh, teams together, or, or two uh, forensics experts, and make short work out of a tragedy. Any questions for Lynn? And, and you know, I understand where Commissioner, or where Bob Colby is uh, coming from and even uh, some of you folks. Um, but unfortunately, uh, as we've seen lately, death and destruction is part of my job. We are often uh, the ones where it just falls to the feet of the county and we have to take care of it. Uh, if, if we don't prepare for it, uh, when it happens, the citizens will come back and ask you why you didn't support this, why you didn't. And uh, so that's why we don't miss it. Lynn, I have one question. Could you just... Uh repeat again the funding for it. it was federal state and was there what was there a match in local 
Uh, currently, the only local, or the, the federal funding, um, this is an overall goal of the state of South Dakota. They send their, their grant into the feds, the feds approve it. Um, so federal funding right now is $50,000 for the equipment. And that comes from the feds to the state. And then the last couple weeks, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, you signed the grant application. We're in the turnover process of that now. So that'll come. Uh, for the training, it's really similar to that. They pay for all the training uh, because, you know, these events don't just happen, uh, you know, on air bases or all these other stuff where the federal government takes care of it. They happen in local South Dakota and local in states and other parts of the country. So we have to have the ability to, to uh, go in there and take care of that. But yes, it's 100% federal funding. The only part that's local is the time and effort of your uh, emergency management staff, the sheriff's office, the fire rescue, the police department, uh, all of those other agencies that would normally be working in this type of an environment. Thank you. One question. Lynn, do you have any idea what the ongoing costs will be, insurance and maintenance and you know, um, it's minimal with this type of equipment because we hope that it never does roll. So there'll be some ongoing costs, I would think, uh, 500 to to $1,000 a year um, for that. We haven't completely looked at that. In other grants that the state has, um, they actually pay for some of that. We're working on that process now. As you know, with the federal budget process, some of that is in limbo. Um, but you know, we're looking at that also. Can you but do I outside don't. storage with this thing? Um, as everything inside storage is much better because we're talking about medical equipment and all these other things, most likely it'll be stored outside for the for the time being because nobody has inside storage for it that we know of. So, but we are actively looking for that also. So, okay, so we probably will get a request for either constructing or renting an inside storage facility. Yeah, we're looking for something that we can make workable for all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Public comment? Okay, guess we'll move on. We're on to regular business. Item number 10 is consider a request from Tri-Valley School District to provide severe weather warning siren near the school district site. <clears throat> Mike Lodenow, if you would just introduce yourself and your address. Excuse me. Mike Lodenow. I'm from 104 East 9th Street, Crook, South Dakota. I'm the superintendent of the Tri-Valley School District. With me today is Mike McRavey, school board president. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here this morning. Um, the Tri-Valley School District is located approximately six miles south of Colton in a very unique rural setting. We're comprised of approximately 830 students and 100, st 100 staff members. At 930 people that can be in our building at any given time, from what I can find, that makes us larger than the Minnehaha towns of Humboldt, uh, Valley Springs, and Colton. We're asking consideration for a severe weather siren to please be placed at our district site for the safety of our staff, students, and patrons. And thank you. Questions from the commission? Mr. Kelly. What procedures right now do you currently have for warning uh, people that are using facilities? That's a good question. We currently ut utilize weather radios and then obviously the internet. Um, intercoms system is what we use if we were would, would be in session at that point in time. My real large concern is after school hours you know I don't think we're unique and probably our buildings are used 80 to 90 percent of the time it might be that parent who has a fifth grade basketball practice for a team camp coming up which might be at seven o'clock at night and I might not be there to warn anybody so in those instances very very minimal so with the weather radio radio I mean generally you can look outside and see that we're gonna have a issue but with the weather radio or with uh, television, is that ability available, say, in the gymnasium or something like that, if, if, a, if a weather alert would come out? Uh, we do not have weather radios in the gymnasium, nor does our district have cable television. So we're, we're kind of limited in, in, in that area. So where is the weather radio now, in the principal's office? In the office? superintendent's office, correct. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question for Mr. McRavey. You would just identify yourself and your address, please. Mike McRavey, Chairman of the Tri Valley School Board, 4708 257 Street, Crook, South Dakota. Mr. Bart. I guess oh, a concern that we have, of course, would be that uh, you know other entities uh, will uh, be 
wanting all of this. Does the school board have any money that they could help us defray the cost on this? Uh, we just now have are entering into an opt out, so our funds are quite limited. Um, we, you know, I guess we're open to a proposal. Uh, we can, you know, I mean, it's it's the safety of our children and, and the public. And when a lot of time during the day, you know, as Mr. Lodmill stated, we are have a population greater than cities in the county, and it is unique because it is that rural. Um, just seems logical as a safety feature to have a warning there. Thank you. We understand somebody has to pay for it. <laughs> Thank you. I would, um, as chairman, is everybody done making comments? I would like to suggest that we maybe form a committee and look at this and look at some of the different options. Um, emergency management has given us a few options. Lynn, did you want to comment at all? You? Yep, please. Uh, Lindy Young, Emergency Management. Um, you know, I I just want to congratulate the school district for looking at some of these things and bringing it forward. Um, I don't think we've ever um, had this type of discussion. And hopefully where this came out of, or maybe where the idea was, is on May 8th, uh, we had a group of, of uh, some of the commissioners and school officials and, and uh, community officials together at Dry Valley, and we looked at... Um, we basically tabletop with the sheriff's office and myself what happens if what happens this and it was uh, weather events it was uh, a, a school intruder program so that's exactly what this is supposed to do is identify shortfalls and hazards that we have in our community and and how we make those better as far as an outdoor warning siren uh, goes within this area um, I did provide the Commission with a couple different options based on the request uh, initial cost or initial estimates for uh, an outdoor warning siren are anywhere from about seventeen five to twenty thousand uh, dollars for the initial purchase, plus about five hundred dollars for <clears throat> yearly maintenance, which includes the battery systems and the maintenance and, and those type of things. And typically, in the past, the county has not, uh, or about twenty years ago, the county actually got out of owning sirens. Uh, at that point, they were used under the civil defense for. Uh, nuclear incidents and, and those type of things. So we got out of the business that was transitioned over into the community so the siren would be owned by um, a community or another government entity. Uh, since then we've only worked with incorporated communities that had the capability um, to maintain these systems because at 500 to a thousand dollars typically rural housing subdivisions and some of these other places are good to go for the first year and the second year but after the third year uh, maintenance falls off and then there's no plan to upgrade and everything so we haven't been out um, working with the rural subdivisions just to plot these out there because as you look at our rural community um, out to the east there are several rural subdivisions the, the uh, uh, village of Corson and uh, excuse me Rowena don't have coverage so there's a lot of areas out there and it's kind of a policy direction is do we want to start putting these or working with those areas in there and uh, three or four years down the road when that association who decided that they wanted one doesn't fulfill their requirements then that falls back on the county to do this with so um, just some of that overview within there I, I did lay out a couple other units including uh, the information that um, several years ago over 300 weather radios were distributed by the county uh, to all the schools daycares uh, uh, congregate care facilities all of those in the county um, so that would be also be an option there about fifty dollars uh, currently our number option three using the weather radio to distribute the information as you've heard that may or may not work in this situation because it may not be manned uh, once again with the advent of, of smartphone technology there are certainly different things uh, that can be done there both uh, for those people that are using and, and for not um, there is a system out it's a tone alert radio system that could be uh, potentially uh, purchased and, and wired right into their uh, current PA system and then that would pro potentially go off even when it's not uh, even when the office as, as uh, Mr. Lino uh, discussed is not staffed and that might be an option that's cheaper um, and then I walked in to some funding options that I have and we've used some of those in the past 
um, I would suggest uh, that those are looked at also. And the one, um, there is a 100% obviously Homeland Security grant. Uh, that de deadline is April 23rd, so I would suggest that if uh, Commissioner Heiberger's suggestion is taken that we move quickly so we could move into some of those other funding options. I do wanna, I did uh, add a map into your uh, packet. Uh, and the blue circles are the current areas in the county and I'm upside down. blue circles are, and I'm still upside down. Yeah, you're still. Hot. Anyways, Ken will straighten me out, but <laughs> um, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> we need the auto right like some of the other things have. Anyways, the, the blue circles, and this is just a small screenshot of, of part of the county, but the blue circles indicate that the indicate areas of the county that are already covered, and as you can see to the north uh, side of the map, if we're looking at the green one, the green one's a current Tri-Valley location, and that's what uh, potential coverage would it, would be within that rural area. Uh, obviously, to the north is Colton, to the east is Lyons, and then Crooks and, and Hartford and everything. So it certainly would be an area um, out in the county uh, that would have significant coverage on their campus. And the current systems that we would recommend, if, if that's the way that's going, you know, would cover a large area of rural Minnehaha County. Um, so you can see what, what that would do. Um, the system would operate in conjunction with current county policies if this is the way to, uh, that's decided. And that would mean it was only operational during tornado events. We don't operate the sirens for um, any other severe weather events just because um, we've thought, we've taken the approach in the past that if you operate it for every severe thunderstorm, people don't pay attention. And unfortunately, what we've seen in the past is uh, what our tornado sirens do is bring people out to look at the tornado and as a result they get hit in the head with a two by four and die. Um, so that's the, the other aspect of tornado sirens. But this is just uh, an FYI of, of what it looks like currently and what it may look like if that's the, the way it goes. So um, I would um, uh, echo uh, Commissioner Heiberger's uh, discussion point that, it, that uh, maybe we do take this back and take a look at it in a small group format over the next several weeks and bring uh, back this, a uh, recommendation to both uh, Mr. Lionel's board and myself to this board, so. Thank you, Lynn. Um, if that's okay with the commission. Well, I'd have a motion. I have a motion. I'd uh, move to, to refer this back to the emergency manager director who could form a committee with two commissioners on it and come up with a recommendation as to what to do with this and this whole policy. Okay. I have a I'll motion second that, but and I have a second comment. with a comment from Commissioner Barth. I, I think this is a great idea and I don't think we should mess around with weeks of meetings and uh, months of discussion. I, I'd like to get it done before the end of, you know, tornado season here. And so if we could uh, move on this expeditiously, I'd really appreciate it. And I, I think it will be. It's a, if it's a small enough committee, it isn't too hard to make appointments. And um, with that being said, I think we will leave it in the capable hands of emergency management. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Um, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Motion passes unanimously. Item 11 is to authorize the chairman to sign amendment to the Joint Security Protection Agreement between the South Dakota Department of Military and Veterans Affairs and Minnehaha County. Keep going. Morning, Keith Winner, Air Guard Division Supervisor. Um, presenting the amendment to the Joint Security Protection Agreement. Um, this amendment notes a deduction of $36,000 to our fiscal 2013 budget. Um, this deduction will not affect the Air Guard Division operations in AMI, so it's just a deduction of $36,000. Do you guys have any questions for me? Any questions for Mr. William? Do we have a motion? I'd make a motion to uh, authorize the chair to sign the agreement. Second. I have a motion and a second to authorize the chair to sign the agreement. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Thank you. Thanks. 
Item 12 is to authorize the chairman to sign an agreement between the South Dakota Department of Transportation and Minnehaha County for the plan inspection of the precast concrete beams for structure 50-150-202, the Ellis Bridge Project. Tom Wilsey. Tom Wilsey, Highway Department. Um, this is an agreement that we did the same thing with the Bal <coughs> excuse me, with the Baltic structure. DOT has personnel that are very experienced and very good at the inspection. We do not have people that are experienced with it. Um, and to, ha to utilize a consulting engineer would cost us a lot more. We think this is a very good, it worked very well on our last project. So we're wanting to do it again on the Ellis structure. Okay. We have a motion. So moved. A motion to approve the inspection. A second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item 13 is to authorize the chairman to sign an agreement between Minnehaha County and HDR Engineering for construction management services for structure 50150-202, the Ellis Bridge Project. Tom Wilsey. HDR did the, inspe did the design on this project. and We would like to... Um, enter an agreement with them to do the construction management. Once again, this is as we did with the Baltic structure, and it has worked very well for us on, a, on that project, and I see no reason why I wouldn't here. Any questions for Mr. Wilson? Commissioner Barr? I'm supportive of this, but at the same time, we do a lot of business with HDR. Are there other companies that do this work? Yes, we're using, we're utilizing Bros Engineering up on 121, we're using um, CDG. IDG. Yeah, what's that? IDG. IDG. They're doing design for our um, bridges on 121. And CDS, CDS, they're doing a structure up north. So, yeah, we're spreading it around as best we can. Thank you. I'll make a motion to force you to sign that, Madam Chair. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Say so, yeah. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item 14 is to authorize the chairman to sign an agreement between Minnehaha County and HDR Engineering for survey, design, and plan preparation for a deck overlay for structure 50-300-118 located on County Highway 109, two miles south and one mile west of Garrison. Tom Wilson. Once again, we're... Uh, utilizing HDR for this project because they have people that have experience with this type of a structure, type of work. Um, the overlay is needed due to severe spalling of the deck, and it's a rather unique type of work that needs to be done. So uh, I'll make a motion there. to approve it. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll just go from there. Say it. I have a motion and a second to approve the contract. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item 15 Mr. is to we'll keep her going. Huh? Keep her going. Item 15 <laughs> authorize the chairman to sign change order number one in the amount of twenty-three thousand three hundred and sixty-nine dollars and sixty-eight cents for project MC one two one STR dash twelve replacement of structures fifty dash two forty dash zero six nine and fifty dash two forty dash zero seven three Eros Road Bridges. Tom we'll see. This is a the structure that I mentioned that Bros has done with us. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> when we tore into that bridge, we found old abutments buried behind the, the existing abutments that we had. And uh, part of this, uh, the last item is the extra work is just the cost for removing and hauling it away. The other thing we found was a very, very large scour hole underneath the old structure that had silted back in with very unstable material. We had to remove all of that to get some stability. We had a couple options on this to, it got, the scour hole went underneath one of our wing walls and we were concerned with stability of that wing wall. Um, the best option after discussion was to put, cast a concrete apron, as is pretty common to do with box culverts. And uh, that's basically about, of this, that's about uh, $13,000 worth of this 
CCO. That is basically an insurance policy for us to save that wing wall. They had an experience once with one out in Hutchinson County where they put the rock wing wall, the rock aprons in and they flushed out and they lost their wing walls. This was a concern here because the water velocity going through that box is quite high. Any questions for Mr. Wilsey? I'm Go wondering, for oh, I'm wondering, do you have any idea how long since that bridge was replaced and those abutments all buried? Oh, Just I curious. have no clue. There were yeah. behind the south abutment, we found two abutments. So it's two previous structures. Just buried. It's up that they just buried them behind it. They've been there a while. Plus, we found a chunk where our crew must have gone in and filled a scour hole with concrete. It's about eight yards of concrete that they filled that hole with. Just getting that out of there was a trick. Okay. Move to, to approve the to change motion. order. Second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same side. Motion passes unanimously. Item 16 is to authorize the chairman to sign a temporary construction easement, utility certificate, letting authorization, right-of-way certificate, and encroachment survey certification for South Dakota Department of Transportation, Project BRO 805064PCN032U, Spook Road Bridge Replacement Project, D.J. Boothie. Good morning, morning. Commissioner D.J. Boothie, Highway Superintendent. I suppose they could have had Tom take care of this one, too. <laughs> um, this project... <laughs> he has a good record of getting them done. Yeah, I'm just waiting for you to chime in and say you moved to approve. Uh, this project is uh, part of the state bridge program. It's the one project that we have had on there. I think it was scheduled and rescheduled for construction uh, several of the last couple of, uh, few years. Uh, it's it's uh, east southeast of Brandon on a township road, uh, Valley Springs Township. And it's in very poor condition. Uh, we have completed all of the local government requirements for letting the project and completing the project uh, during the design phase. And this series of documents is, is uh, certifications and, and easement forms that are required uh, that the county sign and provide to the state prior to the state letting the project. And so, uh, as Cindy said, there's two temporary construction easements. Uh, one of them is is including $600 in damages for the loss of three trees that the county will pay and the other one is is no cost uh, there's a utility certification which uh, basically certifies that the private utilities have been looked at and, and or relocated uh, in order to prevent any problems during construction uh, letting <coughs> authorization which is uh, giving the state the go-ahead that uh, they can let the project and we will uh, we will match 20 percent of the construction cost for the project uh, right away certificate which uh, says that we've looked at the right away and and affirmed that the there is appropriate amount of right away for the completion of the project and an encroachment survey certification uh, which says that there is not uh, anything in the right away that's encroaching that should not be there uh, that would prevent anything on the project from being completed the way that it's designed so with that if you have any questions I can answer them now any questions for Mr. Boothy? Make a motion to authorize the chair to sign this. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 17 is to authorize the chairman to sign Minnehaha County jail per diem contracts with the counties of Aurora, Brookings, Duell, Gregory, Hanson, Hutchinson, Hyde, Gerald, Kingsbury, Lake, McCook, Minor, Moody, Pennington, Sanport, and Turner. Warden Jeff Gromer. Good morning, Jeff Gromer, I'm the warden at the jail. Um, we're just asking to extend these contracts for another year. All of these 16 contracts, the rate was adjusted um, last year. Um, to extend them another year would put them on the same adjustment schedule as Lincoln County, so we'd have all of our county contracts on the same schedule at that point. And that cost is $80.20 20 per day. For inmates other than work release, $35 for work release. Any Questions, Commissioner Car On Keller. the work release, the county pays, the sending county pays us $35, and do we also charge the prisoner? Typically, the prisoner pays it. The no. county will okay. allow them to do that, to do their work release time here, and they pay. And what what do the Minneapolis County work release people pay? Much, and I don't have the number right Is it about number. that same amount? It's a little bit less, I believe. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I would move approval. Make a motion to approve. Second. 
Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 18 is consider a motion to supplement $7,411.88 from the general fund to the state's attorney budget, ASN 15691, data processing equipment, representing reimbursement from the South Dakota Drug Control Fund. Ken McFarland. Commissioners, last week you authorized the state's attorney to accept this particular grant, and he gave you a list of technology equipment that he wanted to buy using those grant funds. This is simply the authorization and the motion to specifically supplement that the amount of that grant, $7,411.88, directly to the state's attorney's budget uh, so that they can uh, actually start purchasing the equipment. So Any we'd ask for your approval. Any questions for Ken? I'd move approval. Motion to approve and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item 19 is to consider submittal of a grant application for part-time help to the South Dakota Council of Juvenile Services for JDAI expansion efforts. Ken McFarland. Commissioners, um, as you know, we've received grant funding uh, for to help support the activities of our JDAI coordinator, Aaron Sertzka, uh, for the last few years uh, through the Council of Juvenile Services. Uh, that particular grant um, was due to expire in June of this year, at the end of June. And I, in fact, I have just submitted uh, what will be the last reimbursement request under the current grant for uh, our coordinator's salary. Um, we thought that the grant was going to be over in June. So it came as kind of a surprise to us when we were notified uh, earlier this month that uh, the council had another $15,000 to be applied for coordinator salary. We had used, and again, you know, we had thought that the money was going to be done by the end of June. We had made arrangements for the county to pick up the rest of the salary through the end of 2013, and we have done that within the commission office budget. So when this grant opportunity be, uh, became available, we uh, um, made a pitch towards the council saying, look, we've already funded this position through the end of the year. This grant funding may be considered to be supplanting. So we had an idea that perhaps we could use the money to uh, uh, apply for part-time help to assist the coordinator in another grant that we've got going on right now which is a $25,000 grant to help expand JDAI into the First Circuit and into Lincoln County. And that, um, so we pitched the idea at the last council meeting and uh, uh, before we would go through the work of applying for the application and, and they thought that would be okay. Well, as it turns out, at that same meeting and that there's going to be a switch on coordinating JDAI activities throughout the state and a shift away from the Council of Juvenile Services and that money is now going to go over to the UJS for control and uh, um, to help supervise JDAI in the state of South Dakota as we go forward. And so in this transition period between the CJS and the UJS, there are some uncertainties that we need to, uh, to work out about what our, you know, what is the UJS plan now going to look like moving JDAI forward. And so at this juncture, and given the time parameters of the grant to help expand activities into the First Circuit, we're going to recommend that we not apply for the grant for the part-time help. Uh, we don't believe we can probably expend it within the time frame um, uh, that we need to. Uh, and the fact is, you know, while it might be tempting to say, look, let's apply it to the full-time coordinator salary, I made a very strong pitch that we didn't need it for the full-time coordinator salary and so I just wouldn't quite feel right about making the application for that purpose. I want to reiterate we still are committed to working under the current grant of 25000 to help expand activities into the First Circuit and the Lincoln County. Much of that money we think will be okay as we move forward to JDAI, you know, coordinating with the UJS because We'll be using that money primarily to, to get um, supplies and training materials to help conduct the workshops that are going to be needed in the First Circuit and in Lincoln County in order to help expand JDAI efforts. So we think that we can do that under the parameters of our current funding and don't need the 
um, 15,000 grant funding for part-time help as we originally pitched. And so we would recommend that we not make application for that. Um, so uh, we just th think that if we did that, uh, given the uncertainties of how we transition, it would just be an, an unwarranted expenditure of grant funds. Plus this gives the, the Council of Juvenile Services an opportunity to redirect and repurpose those monies uh, into other areas uh, that would help further their work. So that would be our recommendation at this time. Any questions for Ken? Comment. Comment, Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Ken, I want to compliment you on this because way too often grant money is hanging out there and it's like low-lying fruit and we just, or low-hanging fruit and we just grab it. Um, the fact that we don't need this money is probably uh, a very valid argument for not, not even in, uh, putting a grant in and I, I think it was a good move on our part. Uh, I think we should look at all grants that way. Do you need the thing? And if you don't need it, don't take it. I'd have a motion if nobody else has any other comments. Any other comments? I would just say that I also I agree with Mr. Kelly that or Commissioner Kelly that you know we've looked at this thoroughly, had intended to take it originally, but with the changes that have come forward, I think this is a good decision for us too, and that CGS can use their money as they further their other projects and stuff, and that we will just continue to see how this grows out. So, did you want to make a motion? Uh, I have a motion to take no action on the grant have a motion take no action on the grant. Second. I thought it was, well, okay. I have a motion and a second. Just for clear, point of clarification, I thought we were considering submittal of the grad amp for part-time help. We were, we're, I'm recommending that we not submit that grant application at all for all right, 15,000. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we have a motion and a second to, um, what did he say? Well, he said take no action. Take no action. To submit the grant. To submit the grant. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item 20 is to authorize the chairman to sign an agreement between South Dakota Department of Social Services and Minnehaha County for a clinically managed residential detoxification program. Ken McFarland. Uh, commissioners, as you know, we currently uh, receive state funds for the operation of our clinically managed residential detoxification program. That current contract expired at the end of May and we have received the new contract from the state that would provide uh, funding uh, to help manage that program from June 1 of 2013 through May 31st of 2014. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the current contract uh, that expired in May 31st was adjusted a couple different times through the course of the year and ended up that it was in the amount of $106,210. What the state is proposing and is set aside uh, for the coming uh, contract year is $127,220 in state funds. Um, as you know, that's just one leg of the stool for detox. The city also provides us $210,000 to help manage the detox program, and the uh, county is then responsible for any balance. Uh, the official budget for detox this year is $716,778 through the end of this particular year. I know, and we had a very, I'll just say, a very excellent article about the, in the Argus today about some of the issues that the uh, county is is going through with detox and how that detox program may look next year. Uh, I, with that in mind, and the state knows very well that we are having these kind of discussions and we've had conversations with the state and I have confirmed with the state that if you do in fact enter into this agreement to accept, to act, to continue to access some of these dollars to help offset the cost of detox in our county, um, under this new contract that in the event that you do change directions come the first of the year that they will be more than willing to work with us so that we're not bound to continue this if you change your model before the expiration of this contract year and that uh, here. So this would give you the opportunity if you approve this to continue to access some of the monies uh, that the state does provide to help offset the cost of the detox program. And of course, with that in mind, while you're accepting that money, you're still under the accreditation program and plan and requirements of the state 
as you continue to review your model. Any questions for Ken? Commissioner Kelly? Not a question, but a comment. Uh, there is item 11 is termination agreement, and there is the right of either party to terminate within 30 days written notice. So, Correct. Thank um, you. With that in mind, I'd move to approve the contract. So a motion to approve the contract. I'll second it. I have a question for Ken. Second with a question. Ken, you know, in the detox, uh, uh, do we have citizens coming in from the other rural communities, or is it primarily people from Sioux Falls that are <coughs> taken there? Right now, uh, we do on occasion. Uh, we do take um, people in from other counties if there is a bed available. You know, well, in detox. I guess I was wondering if we have them from Lyons or Del Rapids, or if they're mainly from, say, Phillips Avenue. Oh, <laughs> well, I will tell you, the vast majority, the vast majority of the clientele that we operate in the detox do, in fact, come within the city of Sioux Falls, and that they do. But I mean, there are occasions we do get residents, you know, from other parts of this county. We do take other clients from out of. A county on a space available basis which is very rare and and we very rarely get a detox person from another county we also have a contract with the feds for u.s probation and that's only used sparingly as well so the vast majority of the beds are taken up from folks right here in good old sioux falls and then of course with the city and that portion of the city of sioux falls within lincoln county because of the contribution of the city of sioux falls to the program. Any other questions for Ken, Commissioner Kelly? Well, another comment. It's important to note that uh, not all the people in detox are street people or, or the That's homeless, true. as we know, that they they come from all, all walks of life. And even though there's a significant number of them come off the street, they, there are others involved. There. Any other comments? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item 21, our Minnehaha County Commissioner Liaison Reports. Does anyone have a liaison report? Seeing none, we'll move on to it. Is there any new business? Is there any? Oh, I have one, one new business. Yeah, just a point of information because I know it's the topic of you folks have asked about. Um, the South Dakota Association of County Commissioners is uh, getting, you know, has a deadline when they review resolu resolutions that will be submitted for consideration at our state convention in September. Uh, both districts and counties who want to submit resolutions for consideration at the annual convention must have those submitted by the end of uh, July. And that, so with that in mind, what we will do is I will have an item on next week's agenda to uh, solicit ideas, comments from this group about uh, topics that you would like to see, to see addressed for potential uh, legislative changes uh, to be considered by our state association. We'll talk a, a little bit about that. I'll get a sense from you what kind of resolutions you want to see. Robert and I will craft those resolutions and bring them back to you for formal consideration at a later meeting prior to the July deadline for submittal and that to the association and then so that's the process that we'll use to uh, flesh out and now what resolutions you would like to submit right, I follow up on yep. what Ken uh, this morning Kyle and Robert and I met just discussing the tax exempt status and, and the study group that we've got on the state level um, and Kyle is going to be at the district meeting and discuss this briefly uh, we're finding out that no action might be the best place. The, the last time they had a hearing, a, a full-fledged deal at the legislature, 10 years ago, um, they led the whole thing, they left everything in place and added another tax to exempt. So uh, we've decided perhaps it's not the best battle to fight at this point, but we're going to accumulate some other information, and then uh, I'm going to send a report out, and I will include that commission on that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Ken? Any old business? Is there any old business? That being said, we will um, adjourn with into executive session for personnel. Do I have a motion? That's my so motion. Moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn into executive session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those, all those aye. in favor say aye. Those aye. opposed say aye.